Hello and welcome to our AAA colloquium on complex dynamic systems theory applications to second language development. That's a mouthful. With a special focus on methodological challenges. My name is Van der Lowe and it's my pleasure to introduce the theme and the speakers in our colloquium. Looking ahead at the future of CDST for SLD, we also need to look back. This is done very thoroughly by Hiver, El Hori and Reed in a systematic review of 25 years of research within a complex dynamic systems approach. It shows the many new insights the approach has yielded, but it also shows several challenges that the application is facing. The challenges are mostly methodological and several of these are addressed in our colloquium. First, there is the observation that very little research has been done that involves interaction. Ninka Smith and colleagues discuss a dynamic approach to classroom interaction and shows some of the results of their studies. Then Hong Ying Peng will present her research on promising techniques to do complex dynamic studies that go beyond the individual, using clustering techniques where groups of learners have not been predetermined by the researcher, but emerged from the data. Our third paper by Mei Wu and colleagues takes a critical stance on the reliability of measurements used in longitudinal research, making a comparison to G-theory calculations of reliability. Also Akira Murakami, the fourth, the fourth paper, uh, will address challenges we are uh, facing in longitudinal research with a focus on the discrepancy between group averages and individual patterns of development and proposes the technique of learner mean centering as a new way um, to deal with this. Finally, we can listen to Zhao Hong Han's summary and critical evaluation of the work presented at this colloquium. And um, we hope you will enjoy watching the presentations at our colloquium and hope to, to see you live at the uh, discussion after the last recording presentation. See you later. In this talk, we'd like to present a systematic review of 25 years of research using complex dynamic systems theory in language learning. For all three of us, it's clear that if theories such as complex dynamic systems theory are to avoid becoming academic fads or passing bandwagons, they need to contribute something of substance, something new and worthwhile that pushes the field forward. So since nearly three decades have passed, since CDST was introduced to the field, it seems necessary and appropriate to take stock of work using this theory. What's interesting to us is that the uptake of complexity theory in applied linguistics research has continued to accelerate, pushing further and faster even than related fields such as education or theoretical linguistics. And recent syntheses of strands of applied linguistics research that are informed by complexity theory show that it's made important contributions to these strands of research. So considering this mainstream interest in complexity theory in the field, it seems appropriate and necessary to assess this body of empirical work and evaluate the strength of its contribution to the field. With that brief background, let me introduce the questions we were interested in answering through this systematic review. First, we were interested in looking back at the methodological characteristics of previous complexity studies in the field. We wanted to note trends and tendencies in these different design characteristics. Second, we were interested in the substantive contributions that this body of studies had made to the field and what evidence it had provided for specific domains of study. Finally, we wanted to explore if there were any limitations or potential areas for improving study quality in this domain. So we conducted an initial search for studies spanning a 25 year period. 1994 marks the date of the very first contribution on this topic, a conference paper delivered by Diane Larson Freeman 
at the Second Language Research Forum. Our scope covered peer-reviewed articles, book chapters, conference papers, and doctoral dissertations. We conducted our search in databases in the field, including ERIC, MLA, ProQuest, and Psych Info. You can see in the box our search terms, and we specified where these search terms should appear, either in the abstract or the main text, to avoid false negatives that are likely when searching with generic terms such as complexity. We supplemented this search with a Google Scholar search and an Ancestry search to ensure saturation. To further refine the 2,341 reports that this search returned, we applied our inclusion criteria for the systematic review. In order to be eligible for inclusion, the report had to satisfy the following criteria. Now, during this filtering, we eliminated more than 70 methodological and conceptual articles. By themselves, these are a testament to the robustness of the topical area in the field. We also included terminological antecedents to CDST, including DST, Dynamic Systems Theory, and Chaos Theory. Based on our inclusion criteria, we narrowed it down to 488 reports, and there were no proceedings, conference papers, or book chapters that met all our inclusion criteria, but there were quite a few dissertations in this pool. After all three of us inspected these reports against the inclusion criteria, we decided to retain 158 unique reports for coding. Each of us coded a third of this pool, and to validate these judgments, a team of two trained coders independently coded 30% of all reports. And together, we examined the entire coding scheme and worked out discrepancies through discussion until agreement was reached. Starting with the characteristics of participants in this pool of studies, we can see that although a handful of studies included larger samples, roughly 40% of all studies featured a sample size of 10 or less. And when combined with several other design characteristics, this highlights the increasing importance of individual-based and ideographic research. And within this pool, Studies with younger participants were clearly in the minority. 112 studies sampled university students or adult language learners, and the rarest were studies with participants aged seven and younger. Since complexity theory is a relational, contextual perspective, we expected adequate depth of contextual detail to feature in the studies we reviewed. This table shows a wide range of research contexts were represented in the study pool with foreign and second language learning contexts accounting for almost 84% of the total. Various instructional settings were also part of this pool. In addition to the 79 studies that took place in conventional instructed language settings, a handful of studies were conducted in online, immersion environments, and study abroad contexts. Considering the importance of context in complexity theory research, the number of studies left unspecified either the research context or the instructional setting was puzzling, and we return to this point in our discussion. Participants also represented various L1 backgrounds and target second languages. Among these, what stands out is the dominance of L2 English as a target language. It accounted for nearly 70% of studies in this pool. Turning to study design characteristics, we looked at the general approach to study design and the time scale of data collection. Over a third of studies were cross-sectional, and more than 58% of studies were longitudinal in design. In relation to the field more generally, this seems to be a, a higher proportion of longitudinal studies. Looking at study length, data elicitation took place most often over a time span of months, followed by studies with a time span of weeks, years, hours, and days. Study length in this pool ranged from 90 minutes to four years. But note that these numbers don't refer to the frequency of data elicitation, but the duration of the study itself. So more often than not, the details regarding the frequency of data sampling were not specified in the studies. It made it difficult to determine, for instance, if studies with a time span 
measured in weeks, elicited data daily or twice at the beginning and end of the period, or only once per, per participant over the course of study. With reference to the framework for method integration, we can see that over 80% of studies were exploratory, and only 28 studies had a hypothesis testing objective, and no study combined these two aims. Note that we coded these notions, whether a study was confirmatory or exploratory, from the research objectives formulated by the studies, and not by examining claims made by the authors that their data confirmed or supported certain conclusions. The choice of unit of analysis was also fairly straightforward for many studies in this pool. The unit of analysis in 73 studies was the group, and in 70 studies it was the individual. There were five studies in this pool that included more than one unit of analysis. Now, this is a very small subset of studies, but they illustrate the extent to which relying exclusively on group level data may impoverish the field's understanding of various phenomena. Choice of method was split across qualitative and quantitative studies. And here we adopted an inclusive definition of methodology related to the purpose, the focus, the design and procedures of studies in the report pool. Now, the large number of purely qualitative studies is intriguing and seems to reflect the general tendency for newcomers to complexity theory to apply methods that capture rich, dense data sets. And this is borne out in our data. Roughly 80% of dissertations in this pool draw heavily on qualitative designs. Now, our review in no way suggests that exclusive qualitative methods are poorly suited to studying complexity and change. But we did find particular limitations in this pool of studies. Two of these relate to collecting data and adopting analytical techniques that don't lend themselves to investigating connections in context or dynamic change. Closely related to the design decisions are the choices of data elicitation and data analysis. We found that a range of conventional and widely used techniques were present in the reviewed studies. Now what's notable is that the majority of studies in this report pool included multiple complementary data sources. Studies included at least two, but often up to four data sources in combination. And these were distributed across all years of publication. This may reflect a general tendency to approach data collection in complexity theory research with a more is more mentality because everything counts, everything's connected and everything changes Study design may have followed the premise that more data is more appropriate to fully examine these phenomena. Now recall that in addition to methodological characteristics of these studies, we were interested in determining what substantive contributions this pool of studies has made to the field. We looked at contributions in two broad areas, empirical or theoretical contributions and practical contributions. Now, empirical or theoretical contributions were demonstrated in a variety of areas. Two of the most noticeable were evidence supporting the claim that the phenomena or constructs under study were complex and dynamic. Other notable contributions include evidence of the influence of context in development or the nonlinearity of development or the presence of nonlinear predictors or emergent outcomes and patterns. Other contributions involve studies that show evidence of inter and intra individual variability. And many of these contributions, as you see, are distinguishing features of complexity theory that other theories don't account for or even investigate. We were also interested in what practical contributions complexity theory studies have made to the field. These contributions are sought after by many and perceptions that these applications are not readily available can act as a curb on wider uptake of complexity theory in the field. Now, as this table shows, the practical contributions were not few in number, and they ranged from direct pedagogical insights to fuller, more multidimensional understanding of prevalent issues in the field, and even to the explanatory power of contextual factors in development. Other practical contributions relate closely to applications for research across these topics. This includes studies that helped uncover new insights into phenomena under investigation, studies that shift attention to new 
aspects of existing phenomena or that show limitations of existing methodological perspectives. Our third and final aim relates to methodological rigor and what areas, if any, were apparent for improving the quality of research going forward. And some of the most prevalent design issues we identified were related to data or analyses that were seemingly inappropriate for investigating change and development, or unfortunately studies relying on data and analyses that were poorly suited to studying connections in context. For example, it's not hard to appreciate why studies drawing on a single round of interviews or cross-sectional test data at one or two time points would struggle to shed any light on complex connections in context or dynamic change. So to recap, our systematic review looked at the methodological characteristics of complexity theory research and the contributions this body of research has made to the field, and finally at study quality. Our research points to clear trends, shows that first the field has made strong advances in describing complex systems and identifying various dynamic changes. Now these are core objectives of complexity theory research in applied linguistics. It's also clear from our review that the field has begun to work on another objective, that is modeling complex mechanisms and dynamic patterns using innovative methods for data collection and analysis. Now, as applied social scientists, applied linguistics aims to go further than mere description and enact certain forms of practice in social context. So as a consequence, over two and a half decades of thinking and research in complexity theory Continued work with descriptive findings that are limited to descriptive insights are unlikely to push the field forward in a substantive way at this stage. What still remains to be done is to understand how to intervene or influence systems behavior. To conclude, we'd like to synthesize the methodological lessons we got from this review, and we refer to them here as tenets. Now, the table on this slide and the next slide synthesize these and show these tenets in relation to an individual study or a program of research. Briefly, for individual studies informed by complexity theory, our systematic review suggests that studies should provide a rationale for adopting complexity theory in the first place. In addition, they should articulate how complexity theory informs the design and methods. Studies should specify the aims, units of analysis, and the outcomes or processes under investigation. Form should follow function, and studies should adopt methods of data elicitation and analysis that are driven by these aims, units of analysis, and outcomes under investigation. Finally, studies informed by complexity theory should specify the role of particular contextual factors in the processes under investigation. Going forward, programs of research informed by complexity theory should identify areas for complex interventions to allow researchers to focus on influencing and intervening in systems change. It should also develop criteria for designing and evaluating these systems interventions. Additionally, programs of research should adopt more integrative designs that integrate exploratory and falsificatory aims, individual and group level analyses, and mixed methods. Hello, AAAL Houston. Welcome to my talk, Observe a Lot by Just Watching. My name is Nienke Smit. I'm a researcher from Utrecht University and the University of Groningen, presenting from Groningen, the Netherlands. Um, and uh, let me first introduce my co-authors to you. Those are Professor Marijn van Dijk, a developmental psychologist at the University of Groningen. Professor Kees de Bot, an applied linguist from the University of Pannonia in Hungary, and van der Lowy, an applied linguist from the University of Groningen. I'll be talking to you about how to analyse classroom observational data from a complex dynamic systems perspective. And in my talk, I'll show you how we, um, well, which methods we used to operationalise and measure constructs such as self-organisation, co-adaptation, attractor states, and patterns of stability and variability. But let me first explain to you or give you a snapshot of the kind of observations we did in Dutch secondary language, foreign language classrooms. Um, I'm going to start with a, a story about Gina. 
Um, it's a Friday afternoon in a small village in the north of the Netherlands. And Gina, the teacher, is teaching a group of 16-year-old learners of English. They're discussing a newspaper article about 21st century skills. But the author of the text points out why he thinks communication, creativity, collaboration and critical thinking are crucial skills for global citizenship. Teacher Gina is keen to find out whether or not her learners share the author's ideas. She asks one of the boys in the classroom what he thinks. The question Gina asks is, why do you think communication is an important skill? The, st the student responds in Dutch by saying, by asking first, can I say that in Dutch? And Gina agrees and then the boy continues to say, that het heel belangrijk is dat mensen een taal kunnen gebruiken om zichzelf duidelijk uit te drukken. Which means, it's very important to use language to express yourself clearly. Gina nods, acknowledges the answer, um, and continues the whole class discussion in English. Gina is a teacher who participated in our study. Um, she's enthusiastic, experienced, um, has great rapport with the kids um, and excellent classroom management skills. Um, she loves teaching that group. The group clearly loves her. Her lessons are well organized. Uh, but if we zoom in on this particular lesson snapshot, on this particular observation, and we zoom in on the teacher question and the student answer, we see that the teacher asks a question in English and the student is hesitant to answer in, in English and responds briefly um, in Dutch. Um, this is remarkable, especially remarkable considering the content of the lesson, the importance of communication. Now, in our study, we greatly reduced the complexity of classroom life, which is no doubt um, something that is difficult to capture in a single research design. We simplified the uh, classroom interaction uh, to zooming in on teacher questions and student answers and we coded every single teacher question and every single student response from moment to moment on a four point ordinal scale. We developed a coding scheme which is called Quilt Coding Scheme. Um, you can read more about that scheme in um, the International Review of Applied Linguistics um, but the brief our summary of this scheme is as follows. Um, you see a zero for a non-elicitation teacher question and a zero for no student answer. A one for a closed teacher question, which is a question to which the teacher already knows the answer. Um, and the student equivalent is a simple answer, which, is, uh, which consists of one, two or three words. Um, the second level code 2 is a, a clarification question to which students answer with a, a full sentence and the highest level of complexity teacher question complexity and learner complexity is the open-ended question with the complex student answer and an open-ended question doesn't have a, a, a predefined answer and the, the complex student answer is anything which is longer than a full sentence. So those are the codes which we used for, uh, for teacher questions and student answers. And this resulted in 16 possible combinations of teacher questions and student answers. We collected lessons, we videotaped lessons in the Netherlands in secondary schools. Um, learners in these groups were 14 to 17 years old. And as you can see from the, uh, from the picture, the Netherlands is a fairly small country. Um, we video recorded in 21 different schools, 40 different teachers, uh, roughly 900 kids participated in the, uh, in the study. We coded a teacher question, student answer interaction, so every teacher question, every student answer. This resulted in a data set of um, 2,727 questions. We then um, represented all the questions on the state space, in a state space grid, in a 4x4 four four, um, uh, representation. Um, and um, this allowed us to visualize the, uh, the interaction patterns. 
um, and we build a, uh, a, a model for zones of interaction, which I'll now elaborate on. Um, zones of interaction were defined on uh, based on the 16 different states of teacher-student interaction, uh, but we uh, we aggregated the data um, um, in order to reduce the uh, the complexity. Zone one is defined, as you can see from this picture, by varying levels of teacher activity um, and uh, limited student activity. Zone two, teachers are still relatively active. They do not ask any questions that do not require an answer. Um, and students tend to answer with a simple uh, response or uh, sometimes answer a simple question with a slightly more elaborate response. But the co-construction of meaning, the way we defined it, happened in zone three, uh, because that's interactions which um, are formed by clarification questions from teachers and open-ended questions and longer student answers, so the complete answer, the full sentence, or the complex student answer. Um, and now the, the following analyses uh, all build on these three zones of interaction, zone one, two, and three. So um, let me first show you what the uh, 2700 questions in this representation looked like. So if we fill this state space grid with the empirical data and one dot represents a combination of teacher question student answer, this is what it looks like. The yellow cell represents the dominant pattern. So this was the most frequently occurring combination in our data set. As you can see, this is formed by the closed teacher question and a simple student answer. We also notice that um, there were uh, quite, um, there was quite a large number of uh, uh, questions which were not answered, as, as you can see from the, the, all the dots on the uh, bottom of the graph. Um, and you see that uh, the complex student answers are relatively scarce. Now, in order to see um, the differences between the teachers or between the lessons, I should say, because it's, um, uh, the focus was teacher-student interaction, so these are all characteristics of lessons, not necessarily of teachers or students, but uh, of the lesson. And we um, look at the next representation, a bar chart, which shows a, a one bar for every single lesson. And it um, uses the same colors as the previous chart. So the dark blue is interaction in zone one. The bright blue is interaction in zone two. And the light blue is interaction in zone three. And um, this grid shows that in six lessons, interaction in zone three did not take place. On average, um, interaction in zone one took up 51% of the lesson time, 30% of the uh, interactions were in zone two, and only 13% of the interactions took place in zone three. Um, now, this, these were the differences between the lessons. We also wanted to know um, uh, whether there were differences between zone length. Um, was it actually the case that once interaction was in zone one, it actually stayed there um, longer for a longer period of time than uh, interaction in zone three? And um, what we saw from the uh, from uh, our analysis was, was that interaction was generally really really short after two questions. In 88% of the uh, the cases, interaction would change zones anyway. Um, and uh, this suggests that stability in a certain zone of interaction, well, we didn't really find that in, uh, in our sample. And also um, extensive episodes of interaction in, uh, in zone three were really scarce. Now, if we then go from the data of the entire data set to um, the individual lessons. Um, I'll, I'll show you what it looks like for an, uh, for an individual lesson. Um, this is lesson 19. Um, and in this was one of the very few lessons where there was a, sig a significant relation 
between being in a certain zone and staying in a certain zone. Um, you can see from the, the sequences of dots in zone 2 that there was a tendency for interaction to stay in zone 2 if it's there. But you also see from the movements between the zones that especially towards the end of the lesson um, interaction really varies greatly and goes from zone 2 to 1 to 3, back from zone 3 to 1. Um, so, uh, so basically really, really highly variable patterns. A lesson where we did not find any significant relation between uh, the zones um, is shown in the, in the next chart. Um, and this is what it's what the highly idiosyncratic patterns look like. This is a zone in which this is a lesson in which a teacher asks very many questions, as you can see, because every dot in the, um, in this line graph is also a, uh, a teacher question student answer interaction. And as you can see, it, it's it's really varying throughout the lesson, especially towards the end of the lesson. It's bouncing between zone one and zone two. All in all, what we've seen is that um, it can be helpful to analyze micro interactions, so moment to moment interactions um, which happen on what the time scale of, for instance, a language lesson. If you want to look at um, a process of co adaptation and in a classroom, you see a teacher and students, but also students and students co-adapting to each other all the time. Uh, but questions and answers are easily observable units um, and can be uh, coded reliably, reasonably uh, well. Um, and if you untangle these patterns of moment-to-moment -moment responses, um, you can get insight in the way this pattern of co-adaptation, how people respond to each other, um, emerge. Um, we also saw from the data that the uh, the patterns, well, the di there are large differences between the teachers. Um, not every lesson is the same, and there are also uh, there's also a lot of variability within the lesson. So interaction is sometimes in uh, zone three, as we've seen, but also quite some time in uh, zone one. Whether teachers and learners are aware of these patterns, we do not know. Um, we do know, as we asked the panel of, uh, of teachers, that they recognize um, these interaction patterns, but it's helpful to um, use analyses that uncover the dynamics that allow us to quantify uh, a, a construct such as co-construction of meaning um, in, uh, by examining uh, sequences and time series of, uh, of these, these patterns. So we saw self-organization, we, we visualized that, that initially in state space grids um, and um, eventually also in the, uh, in the line charts. Um, we looked at the, uh, the number of questions interaction stayed in a, in a certain zone. We looked at the proportion of interaction in a certain zone and we looked at transitions between uh, um, the zones which could all have been could all be linked to self-organization, imagines, attracts a state, stability and variability. Um, and this uh, proves to be a, a useful frame to look at classroom interaction. The lens of um, co-construction of meaning uh, in combination with a complex dynamic systems uh, research a theoretical perspective allows us to observe a lot by just watching. Uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, and maybe good evening. My name is Hong Yin Pan, and I'm a PhD student of the University of Groningen. Today, I'm going to present a study uh, of my PhD project, supervised by Professor Wang Deloyi and Dr. Sakayaha. Uh, in today's presentation, I will first briefly introduce, uh, explain why we wanted to conduct it, this study, what we hope, hoped to find out, and introduce uh, the methods we used together with the main findings and implications. Uh, from the literature, we know that 
uh, the process of language development often take uh, often take different forms and sometimes uh, be even be correct, uh, characterized as specific to each individual. Recently, researchers began to argue that making claims beyond the individual level should be a core concern of future L2 development research. To do so, L2 researchers may uh, maybe face a challenge to seek uh, a myth appropriate methods that can help unpack this learner variety. Uh, the, these methodological challenges is even greater for researchers who are interested in uh, mobile language learning, especially those learning in informal out-of-class contexts. Because in, in these contexts, language learners have access to uh, various learning resources and materials online to explore their personal learning goals and learning interests. In this study, uh, we try to take up this challenge and propose a bottom-up methodology uh, first to, uh, to first capt uh, capture the developmental trajectories at the individual level to compare and aggregate those uh, similarly structured individuals and in the end to identify developmental patterns uh, that hold for different individuals. Um, uh, uh, as we took a particular interest in learners' self-initiated language learning with technology and also that occurs outside the classroom, we included participants who had only a limited uh, in-class uh, English instruction and who spent considerable amount of time uh, learning English on their own outside the classroom. The task used in this study uh, originates in informal online practice, a fan fiction task. Fan fiction is a type of writing that continues, interrupts, reimagines uh, stories and characters, characters that have, have already been written about or created by other people. Uh, here is a, an example of the uh, writing prompt we provide it to our participants. Uh, the written samples of this study were uh, collected from January 2019 to October 2019 um, on a, month, a monthly basis, uh, which means we had a total of 90 written samples from the nine participants. The written samples we collected were analyzed uh, on seven complexity measures. Uh, the measures included here are indicative of both syntactical complexity and also uh, lexical complexity in uh, the participant's written production. Um, for the data analysis, I have briefly introduced the methodology uh, we used in the study earlier uh, because we included different complexity measures which are often uh, which are often on different uh, measuring scales. So we first uh, standardized the scores. Then we used time series analysis uh, to capture the developmental trajectories of complexity measures at the individual level. Uh, the three parameters uh, we got here: intercept, slope and autocorrelation auto can give us some information about some basic features of the developmental process, such as the trend, rate of change, and the temporal dependence. Uh, and the third step is we performed a cluster analysis on the parameters we got to identify the typical patterns that have the potential to transcend the individual trajectories. A total of uh, uh, 63 uh, time series analyses were carried out. Uh, this is a part of the results we got from the time series analysis. Uh, uh, from the table, we can see uh, that the uh, parameters varied, uh, varied greatly in the seven 
um, complexity measures for each participant and also varied greatly in the same measure for different participants. Which means each, uh, each participant underwent different trajectories for uh, his or her development of different aspects of complexity. And also uh, means that the developmental process of complexity were also different between um, the participants. This is an observation uh, largely consistent with uh, previous studies on L2 development. However, the variation within the learner and also between learners makes it difficult to visually identify potential patterns. So we use the uh, cluster analysis to do it. Um, here, I'd like to, or uh, before, uh, before uh, for further in, into the presentation, I'd like to point out that some parameters are, uh, are really different from others. So before performing the cluster analysis, we also detected the outliers um, and removed them from our data set. Uh, the cluster analysis we performed uh, uh, yeah, uh, uncovered five clusters. Uh, this, is a, uh, this is a visual uh, representation of it. Each cluster include, uh, each class in include cases uh, with similar uh, uh, parameters here. We further uh, performed statistic analysis, uh, which revealed significant differences between the five cluster, uh, clusters in terms of the intercept, the slope, and also the autocorrelation. I, I mentioned earlier that the three parameters uh, here describe the trend, rate of change, and temporal dependence of the developmental process. So, so the five clusters here reveal five uh, patterns with different developmental read, route, and also ultimate, uh, ultimate outcomes. So far, we have confirmed the existence of different developmental patterns at the cluster level uh, in order to understand how the patterns can be mapped onto the development of different aspects of complexity. We zoomed in and examined the components that composed each cluster um, as it, it is represented in this table. Uh, the table here uh, contains a similar, uh, the table in this slide contains similar content with the previous one, but shows the development of different aspects of complexity for different participants more clearly. <laughs> we mentioned from the start that in this study, we uh, wanted to identify patterns beyond the individual level. So we only paid attention to certain development patterns uh, that held for most of our participants here. Consistent upward patterns across participants were found in the development of syntactical complexity at the sentential level, the lexical variability, and also the lexical rarity. Uh, or maybe we can put it in a more general way that over 10 months informal participation in mobile language learning activities, all participants experienced an increase in their compl written complexity, mastering both syntactic uh, syntactically and lexically more complex language use. Um, the uh, methodology we proposed here may have different implications. Uh, uh, first also is our uh, starting point. That is, it provides methodological possibilities of understanding the essential uniquenesses and also commonalities of learners informal mobile language learning. 
It also provides added value for our understanding of L2 development process in general. That is with a time series clustering methodology. We are, not, we are able to not only describe the individual uh, trajectories uh, that are often specific to the individual, like we, uh, what we did in previous uh, uh, studies, but more importantly, we can identify typical patterns that hold for different individuals. As such, we can find patterned outcomes that are generalizable beyond the individual level uh, to a wider population. The third implication is about to what extent can we generalize fundings from the individuals? Uh, previous studies have shown that fundings concerning L2 development process at the group level cannot be directly translated to the uh, individuals and vice versa due to the ergodicity problem. According to our funding, uh, our, to, according to our studies, we agree that it may not be appropriate to generalize between an individual and the group as a whole, but it is feasible to generalize between an individual and a cluster uh, identified through a, a cluster analysis. Okay, uh, that would be all of uh, this presentation. Thank you. Questions, comments, and suggestions are so welcome. Hi, I am May, a PhD student of Applied Linguistics at University of Groningen. Today I'm talking about mirroring the development of writing skills over time, focusing on an issue in writing measurements used in CDST studies. Um, as we all know that CDST studies, uh, many of them, have used single task writing samples to come to an understanding of language development. These single tasks have then been assessed by readers or by analytic measures, typically the CAF measures, complexity, accuracy, and fluency. It is unknown if the results of such measures are reliable, even though the tasks and writing conditions uh, in CDST studies are normally well restricted. Uh, this experiment then zoomed into the single task writing samples rated by CAF measures, uh, trying to investigate the, their reliability. In the meantime, we researched the impact of two assessment characteristics, task topic and task taking occasion. Task topic is easy to understand. Um, task taking occasion in this study refers to the time length between two adjacent uh, samples. We investigated if samples collected at one moment in time will be essentially different from the samples collected at different moments in time, such as different weeks. And in this study, the maximum time difference was um, three weeks. Therefore, we have these two research questions. The first is, to what extent does the task topic affect the reliability of single task writing assessments that are strictly restrained? In other words, if you take one writing assessment, how much does the topic affect the score? How much variation in score is due to topic? The second question is, to what extent would the task taking occasion defined by the timelines of collecting one set of samples affect the reliability of writing assessments? This is to say, if you take two writing assessments, how much will their scores differ when they are taken within one day versus within three weeks? How much variation is due to task taking occasion? To answer these two research questions, um, we had uh, 18 Chinese learners of English volunteered in this experiment. They were university and pre-uni students that were interested in studying abroad. Uh, in total, they performed five IELTS writing tasks taken from the IELTS academic writing module, essay task. Um, 
the students perform task one, two, three on day one, and then task four on day 11, and then task five on day 21. At the meantime, we inserted a pair of C tests, also piloted by this study, um, at the beginning and end of um, their 21-day investigation. And the purpose of this, these two C tests was to uh, observe if there is any uh, overall change on their general English proficiency. Also, uh, this experiment was conducted uh, in January uh, at the beginning of February 2020, which was during the COVID-19 lockdown in China. So we had to assign all those tasks online and uh, the students also performed these tasks online under the supervision of the researcher. They were write writing under the timed uh, condition. In total, we had 90 texts, and uh, these texts were scored by uh, six um, Atlantic measures, four CAF measures, and two cohesion measures using different computer programs. The scores obtained from the six measures were then studied by a statistical module called generalizability theory, or G-theory. Um, what G-theory can do is that it tells us the generalizability or reliability um, of the assessment results and the role of um, assessment characteristics that are interested by the researcher or decision maker. Um, we used two G-study designs to answer different research questions. But before we design the two G-theory analysis, we first looked at the um, C-test result and did a paired sample T-test. Um, there was no significant difference found between the two um, set of uh, C-tests which means that the learner's overall English proficiency did not change um, significantly uh, during the 21-day investigation. This means that we can safely accept a uh, sample produced at any time within the 21-day um, period as um, equally acceptable replacement for each other. Based on this, we set it up to generalizability theory analysis. The first one aimed at the uh, effect of task topic and uh, the generalizability or reliability of single task writing assessment. It included all five tasks. And the second um, only aimed at uh, the effect of task taking occasion. In the second design, um, we included two occasions. The first occasion um, consisted of two tasks written both on day one, um, which, is co which was called the uh, one moment uh, occasion. And then the second occasion, which was called the multi-moment occasion, um, took one task written on day one that was not used in uh, the previous occasion and one task from day 21. Then we contrast we contrast to uh, different time lengths in this design. The results of the um, G-theory analysis were presented as in the uh, result section. It has two parts um, of outcomes. The outcomes of the first um, G-theory analysis are presented in this table. Um, this analysis um, locates three source of score variance. The first one is person, which is also called the universal score. It's the same as um, the uh, true score in classic test theory. The second is task topic, um, which is the interested assessment characteristic in this study. Last is um, residual, including the interaction between person and um, task topic and uh, some random effects. As you can see from the, uh, this highlighted part, uh, task topic introduces um, different amount of score variance in different traits. Uh, for accuracy and fluency, 
it introduced it introduces zero score variance. The G and D coefficients presented at the bottom lines of this table tell us how reliable the assessment results are. Um, this study um, set 0.8 as the uh, treasured for um, a reliable result, but the coefficients shown in this table was based on five tasks. So this is how reliable um, when the writing assessment consists of uh, five writing tasks. To know um, how reliable a single task writing sample is, we need to look at the uh, generalizability estimation uh, when the number of uh, tasks in the assessment was one. Uh, that can be done by G-theory uh, using a D study, decision study. The figures present the uh, estimations when the number of tasks ranged from 1 on the left side to uh, 25 in an assessment. And it is clear that none of the uh, language treats reached 0 0.8 uh, when there was only one task in the assessment. Um, even for accuracy and fluency, those um, who are not affected by task topic, they still need like two to three tasks to be reliable. That's the first set of outcome. The second outcome, um, the second set of outcomes are about the effect of task taking occasion. This analysis located five sources of score variance, um, as you can see in this table. Um, task taking occasion per se introduced zero score variance in any of the six uh, language traits. It interacted with um, task topic and um, person a little bit in some uh, measures. So. What do these results mean for us? Well, let's first try to answer the research questions. So the first question, what we know now is that scores obtained from accuracy and fluency measures uh, from the single task writing samples show distinctly higher reliability than the uh, rest measures. Yet none of the scores are reliable, as suggested by the um, generalizability coefficient estimates. And secondly, um, when the tasks are well controlled, uh, as in this study, task topic per se brings a different amount of score variance in these linguistic traits, except accuracy and fluency. Um, an interesting thing about the six type of scores is that they yield um, distinct generalizability coefficients. Why is this the case? Why they are not equally um, reliable? Is it because the disparate internal characteristics of the uh, language traits or the traits are affected by the in identical external factors, diversity, or both of the potential reasons jointly play a role? If we look back at the result section, we will find that the second reason is more likely. From this table, we can clearly say that the traits are, the six language traits are affected by task topic differently, which is the external factor researched by this study. The residuals suggest the same. We can say that uh, every individual uh, participant also interacts with task topic uh, differently. This is in line with CDST that holds the subsystems of a language uh, system, including the linguistics, are growing asynchronously due to their unique interactions with internal and external factors and the diverse interactions in between the systems. Those unique dynamics in each subsystem then result in the uh, distinction in reliability. And then the next step is to look at the effect of uh, task taking occasion. As shown by the second set of results, task taking occasion per se did not attract any score variance in any of the six uh, language trees. 
why is this the case? Well, we think this has something to do with the experiment setup. Um, the participants in uh, this experiment, they were in a pose of schools and language tuition due to the COVID-19 lockdown in China. This is pretty unique because participants in longitudinal L2 writing studies normally have some stimuli for writing development, uh, such as a language course being in an immersion uh, environment, etc. Lacking stimuli for writing development could be the reason why um, the occasions did not attract any score variance for the participants. Now we have answered all the research questions and the last focus of this talk is that should we continue use single task writing assessments or samples at all? The answer is no and yes. Firstly, this experiment only looked at single task writing samples rated by analytic measures separately. This type of assessment is not suggested when making important decisions such as school admissions or marrying L2 learners uh, language proficiency. When we have to use this type of uh, assessments or samples, it might be better to look at the scores on more reliable traits such as accuracy and fluency. This also calls for studies, uh, future studies to investigate the reliability of more language traits such as coherence. As for CDST studies um, that are interested in the dynamics of an L2 writing system, it is not a problem as the um, variations and, uh, between assessments and samples actually reflects the dynamics, but we need to be cautious about interpreting the score variance. Do the differences between tasks represent language development over time, or it is the dynamics of an L2 writing system within an attractor state? Future studies need to dig more into the single tasks used in CDSD studies. At the end, I want to thank Dr. Rosmer Steincross and Professor Wander Lowy for their great ideas and wonderful work they contributed to this study. I thank you for watching this presentation. Hello, everyone. I am Akira Murakami at the University of Birmingham. In this talk, I like to introduce a statistical means to appropriately identify the relationship between two variables at the level of individual learners based on longitudinal data. We all know by now that averages cannot describe individuals. The average developmental pattern has been shown to be different from the individual patterns that constitute that group mathematically, empirically, and computationally with simulations. The learning curve of the averages matches the average of the learning curves only when the growth can be expressed by the weighted sum of individual parameters. What that means is that many well-known developmental patterns in SLA, like power law functions, um, do not satisfy the condition. Heathcote et al. claimed that researchers can no longer afford to ignore or worse to dismiss the effect of averaging as being irrelevant to real data from the paradigms used in the study of learning. CDST researchers have been calling for a stronger focus on individual learners for quite some time now because group level data are highly unlikely to generalize to individuals. And some studies indeed empirically demonstrated the discrepancy between group level developmental patterns and the patterns at the level of the individuals in second language acquisition. Studying L2 development at the level of individual learners entails collecting multiple data points per learner over a period of time. In other words, we need um, longitudinal data. And quantitative longitudinal data such as longitudinal learner corpora are becoming available these days and um, appropriate statistical tools to analyze such data have been developed and introduced to the field as well. 
One of the oft used statistical techniques in analyzing longitudinal data in SLA and elsewhere is multi-level modeling, especially mixed effects models. In mixed effect models, analysts often want to identify within learner relationships between variables. CDST researchers, for example, have investigated relationships between various linguistic variables in developmental patterns at the level of individual learners. Spoilerman and Braspora, for example, identified what is called a supportive relationship between word complexity and sentence complexity. So if an essay written by a learner tended to include complex words, that same essay also tended to include complex sentences. Similarly, Braspora et al. identified a competitive relationship between sentence length and type token ratio as well. So if an essay tended to include longer sentences, then um, that same essay tended to be less lexically diverse. Just like developmental trajectories, however, the relationship between variables may differ between the between learner level and the within learner level. An erroneously generalizing between learner level phenomena to within learner um, phenomena is called ecological policy. Um, for instance, let us consider the relationship between the time a learner spent on writing an essay and the quality of that essay, operationalized as, say, MTLD. The two variables might be negatively correlated at the between learner level, because more proficient learners presumably produce more lexically diverse essays with less time. In other words, if you look at um, multiple learners, those who spend more time may be the ones who write less lexically diverse essays. The two variables may, on the other hand, be positively correlated at the within learner level, because spending more time on an essay could make it lexically more diverse within individuals. So in other words, um, if you look at a single learner, if he or she spends more time writing an essay, that essay may um, tend to be more lexically diverse. The point here is that the two um, levels ask fundamentally different questions, and researchers need to specify the level that they are interested in. Um, it's not the right question to ask whether X and Y are related in general in longitudinal data. Here's a concrete example based on hypothetical data. The horizontal axis represents the number of minutes for an essay to be completed, um, whereas the vertical axis represents MTLD, and lexical diversity measure. Um, if we simply regress MTLD against the number of minutes, we find that the two are negatively related. So um, the more time uh, it takes, um, the less lexically diverse um, an essay gets. But in fact, um, the data were drawn from six um, learners. And if we draw lines, regression lines, um, within individual learners, um, here's what we get. We can see that the pattern is generally positive. So the number of minutes in MTLD are positively correlated. In other words, the direction of the relationship between the two variables switched from the between learner level to within learner level. And this is called Simpson's paradox. A key statistical question is how to disaggregate different levels of relationships between two time-varying variables. Um, so the variables whose values change across time within individuals. If we simply regress an outcome against a predictor, the slope coefficient is uninterpretable because it blends the information up between learner and within learner levels. And one technique frequently used in multi-level modeling is what's called person mean centering, um, also known as within person centering or um, group mean centering when individuals are nested within um, groups rather than um, 
individual data points nested within um, individuals, like in our case. The problem of a time varying predictor is that it contains both between learner differences and within learner differences. And through learner mean centering, we can separate those two types of information. Centering, more generally, is the operation where the mean value is subtracted from the original values of a variable. So if the original values are 1 through 5, the mean will be 3, so the centered value uh, um, is negative 2 to positive 2. In learner mean centering, centering is performed with respect to the mean of the learner in concern. So in this toy data, um, there are only two learners, and the second column shows the number of minutes um, each learner took to write each essay. We then calculate the mean number of minutes per learner. Um, it was 23 minutes for learner 1 and 27 minutes for learner 2. We then um, calculate the difference between the raw number of minutes and the average number of minutes uh, for that learner. Uh, and uh, that here's what we get. Um, here, notice that the value of a between learner variable uh, remains the same within each learner. So it cannot explain within learner variability. The variable only explains between learner relationships. So whether learners who spend more time on average tend to produce essays with higher or lower MTLD. On the other hand, the mean value of a within learner variable is zero and is the same across learners. So the variable cannot explain between learner differences because there's no difference between learners. The variable, on the other hand, explains within learner relationships. So whether spending more time leads to essays with higher or lower MTLD within a learner. And instead of including the row minute variable, which is the second column in this table, um, we can include these two decomposed type of variables representing minute. And by that, we can separately analyze the relationship between minute and MTLD at the between learner level, which is represented by the between learner minute variable, and the within learner level, represented by the within learner minute variable. Up until here, we have not been concerned with longitudinal development. What we were looking at was the relationship between two variables within individual learners, but we were not looking at longitudinal development as such. So could the within learner relationships between the time spent on writing and MTLD thus identified be attributable to learners' longitudinal development? Let us suppose this figure shows the order of writing within individual learners. So as far as the orange uh, learner is concerned, um, this is the first writing that he or she wrote, uh, and this is the second one that the person wrote, uh, followed by this writing, and so forth. Here, the order of writing and the time spent on writing are negatively correlated, pointing to the possibility that the identified within the learner relationship between the time in MTLD may have only been due to the learner's longitudinal change. So, for example, the learners might have gotten tired uh, writing essays and decided to spend less time on them. And because they were tired, uh, their essays came to be less lexically diverse. And the point is that if a chronological trend is correlated with a predictor of interest, in our case it's minute, it may overshadow the relationship between the predictor and the outcome. And in such a case, 
we might want to detrend the predictor. So minute in our case. There are two broad ways of detrending. The first approach is to detrend a predictor and include the detrended variable as a predictor in the main analysis. And this two-step approach has been used in SLA as well. The second approach is to include the time variable as a predictor um, in regression modeling. Um, this time variable is basically the variable representing time passage. So in our case, um, it could be something like the order of writing. And this latter approach is generally recommended because the former two-step approach fails to incorporate the uncertainty in the initial detrending phase and leads to the inaccurate estimates of standard errors and confidence intervals. So in other words, um, the uncertainty associated with the initial step is not passed toward, um, onto the second main analysis. In our hypothetical data, when time operationalized as the order of writing is included as a fixed effects predictor, a minute is detrended. Then the within learner relation between the time spent on writing and MTID was still significant, which suggests that the two variables are related beyond the chronological trend. So even after um, controlling for the chronological trend, the two variables were still significantly correlated. To wrap up, um, the relationship between variables could vary across different levels of analysis. And in the investigation of longitudinal data, the level of interest should be explicitly specified and, and stated. Learner mean centering is a useful technique in separating between learner and within learner relations between variables. The time variable detrends chronological patterns from other predictor variables and should be included when within learner relations of variables after accounting for such patterns are of concern. Um, thank you for listening. And here's the list of references. Hello, welcome to this segment of the CDST Colloquium titled The Future of CDST Approaches to Second Language Development, Methodological Challenges and Proposed Solutions. First of all, I'd like to thank Dr. Wanda Lowy for the invitation to serve as discussant at this colloquium. It's an honor and privilege. In the next 15 to 20 minutes, I'll start with a brief discussion of the theory CDST, and from there to talk briefly about the five studies presented at this colloquium, and I will close with some thoughts on the future of CDST research. The late renowned astrophysicist Stephen Hawkins referred to the 21st century as the century of complexity. And that sets the scene for complexity thinking and its transdisciplinary applications, including in applied linguistics and second language acquisition research. In the field of second language acquisition or applied linguistics writ large, CDST began in the 1990s as two separate theories, complexity theory or CT, with its emphasis on the system nature of a complex phenomenon and DST or dynamic systems theory with its emphasis on process. Over the last decade, the two theories have come together joined by a holistic view on learner, learner language and development and by a shared interest in applying that view to studying language use and development. At this point, what are the emerging properties from the merger of these two theories is still an open question. 
but it's an interesting question. DST and CT are compatible on some levels, but they're also different. For example, complex systems are also dynamic. Both DST and CT represent a systems thinking, considering language and language development, complex, dynamic, and adaptive systems. Where the two differ is that DST deals with the so-called restrictive complexity and CT addresses general complexity. Where they differ also is that the DST is fundamentally an object theory and CT a meta theory. So what is a meta theory? What is an object theory? Uh, a meta theory guides, it serves as a conceptual lens and it addresses ultimate questions, macro big questions. An object theory, on the other hand, deals with specific phenomena and the so-called proximate questions. Complexity theory serving as a meta theory can guide studies on language, language learners and users, language learning, and language teaching. Now at the nexus of a CT as a meta theory are a number of a fundamental tenets, such as language development is isomorphic with language use. As a complex dynamic adaptive system, language development automatically reacts to contextual influences. Patterns in language arise from individuals interacting, adapting their language resources to a changing environment. In order for patterns to be revealed, organic interactional affordances must be available to L2 learners. Language in use cannot be usefully segregated from its ecology. Turning now to DST, as an object theory or CDSD, as we've seen more and more in the current literature. CDSD as an object theory focuses on development as a complex phenomenon. Among its assumptions are development is dynamic, development is idiosyncratic, and development is contingent. Studies guided by DST have led to many findings, including some methodological findings. So for example, there's a big difference between a product-oriented study and a process-oriented study. Another big finding is ergodicity, which essentially means that results from group studies do not generalize to individuals and longitudinal data sets are absolutely necessary when studying development. Among the methodological challenges that are currently facing CDST researchers are many. Some of them have been captured in the hybrid et al. synthesis. This particular colloquium addresses two of the methodological challenges, reliability and generalizability. So looking back at the history of a CDST empirical research, it appears that the field has actually evolved quite a lot beginning with describing and charting individual trajectories, which I refer to as uh, efforts made in phase one. And now we're in phase two, where the concern is, ex is extrapolations, whether findings 
can extrapolate from individual studies to groups. And what constitutes the next phase, phase three? That's something we can begin to think about. CDST guided empirical studies have to meet a number of requirements, data requirements. The data need to be natural, they need to be contextual, interactional, dense, individually oriented, and also longitudinal. These are minimal data requirements. Turning now to the five studies presented at this colloquium. Five studies, the five studies begin with the Hiver et al. research synthesis complex dynamic systems theory and language learning, a systematic review of 25 years of research. The Schmidt et al. studies, observing a lot by just watching, analyzing the dynamics of teacher-student interaction. The Peng et al. study, to what extent can we generalize from individuals, a time series clustering method methodology? The Wu study, measuring the development of writing skills over time. And the Murakami study, time varying predictors and learner mean centering in modeling the development of individual learners. Let's uh, talk a little bit about the Hiver et al. synthesis. This synthesis is the first attempt in the field to take stock of the empirical endeavors invoking CDST, providing a useful overview both of what has been done and of what appears needed going forward. And such an attempt is welcome and timely, given that CDST has putatively been around for a quarter of a century and that there is a rapid growth of studies of referencing it in miscellaneous ways and for a spectrum of a purposes. I would characterize this study by invoking this physics formula. P here stands for momentum. According to this physics formula, momentum is the equal to mass times velocity. This synthesis captures the momentum in CDST research. Let's now look at the four empirical and methodological studies more closely. Uh, here are the four studies. The Schmidt et al. study focuses on teacher-student question and answer behaviors using cluster analysis. The Pung et al. study explores the fiction writing and CAF. CAF stands for complexity, accuracy, and fluency. The study uses a type of cluster analysis as well. The, the study explores the reliability of single task writing assessments, employing G theory as the analytic tool. And the Murakami study showcases the learner mean centering technique in an attempt to disentangle between learner variability and within learner variability. All four studies are meticulously conducted and they all report promising findings. More importantly, they all demonstrate that the methods and techniques are doable and feasible. Now I'm gonna talk about some of my lingering concerns. Looking at the four studies, looking at the studies that have been done in the field, it appears to me that there is a need to explore the systems nature of development. And there is a need to establish rather than assume a complex system. 
Relately, there is a need to untangle the entanglements within the complex system. There's also a need to attend to time and space. And there's a need to investigate what external and internal forces come into play and how they interact over time to shape development. And there's a need to engage with constructs. There's also a need to integrate with other methodologies such as triangulation. And there's a need to balance an attic and an amic perspective. Essentially, there's a need to take into account when designing and implementing studies, three elements, human, time, and space, or in our context, the learner, the time, and also the context. And let's keep in mind, CDST stands for Complex Dynamic Systems Theory. So might this be something for phase three? Current studies have paid a lot of attention to time, but not enough attention to context. And here's what Larson Freeman said about context. Complex systems are context dependent. That, that is, they are inseparable from their environment or context. We would like to see studies taking into consideration the spatial temporal context and how that interacts with the learner. Exploring the system nature of a complex phenomenon is essential, but let's start with a very basic question. What constitutes a system? Should the system be determined in a top-down manner or a bottom-up manner? And more specifically, given that a CAF or a CAF has been used widely, in SLA research, including in studies guided by CDST. The question that I like to ask here is, is CAF a system? Does it have any psycholinguistic reality? Or is it a function of a system of which we don't have much knowledge yet? And there are all kinds of systems. Uh, there isn't just one system, and there are systems of different scales. There can be a system that's macro. There can be a system that's uh, that's a micro system. And if we um, think about a macro system in relation to language development, at least. Some of these things are relevant, the cognitive, the psychological, the linguistic, and the environmental. Let's delve into this CALF thing a little further. Is, Cal, is CAF a system? So CAF, most of you know, refers to complexity, accuracy, and fluency. These are performance indicators. And CAF has been used a lot in L2 writing research and also in L2 task-based research. In L2 task-based research, there are a few insights that are worth exploring, thinking about investigating systems. One comes from Skian's trade-off hypothesis which stipulates that there is interaction between learner attention and task characteristics. So this, to me, comes quite close to the interaction between the learner and the context and the environment. 
So the hypothesis goes like this, depending on how the how learner interact, a uh, learner attention and task characteristics interact, that will result in the learner's differential attention to form and meaning, which then may manifest itself in the learner's performance in terms of complexity, accuracy, and fluency. Another insight that might be worth exploring in CDST research in terms of determining a system. And this comes from Robinson's triadic framework for task design, where Robinson postulates three components, task complexity, task condition, and task difficulty. These three things can interact to determine an L2 learner's use of the target language. And if you trace that over time, you might be able to see development or lack of development and or patterns. Turning now to another question that's perhaps a little bit closer to the studies presented at this colloquium, what underlies a cluster? That question is worth asking if we want to go beyond what we're able to do at this time. Simply showing trajectories is not enough. Showing variation and heterogeneity is not enough. Process orientation, which is what CDST pursues, ought to go deeper in empirical studies. Studies ought to identify, again, system components, and studies ought to establish patterns at a deeper level, at a system level. Integrating with a traditional methodology such as triangulation, might be something worth attempting. Seeking answers, uncovering developmental patterns in an environment, in a system environment involving learner and the environment and the context is something we ought to pursue. And then last but not least, relating these patterns back to the surface trajectories. Might this be something for phase three? There is a pressing need, just looking at the studies, to, there's a need to engage with constructs. So again, I would argue within the context of learner time and space interaction. There's a need to engage with constructs such as system. What is a system vis-a-vis -vis the phenomenon in question and what constitutes a complex system? And what is development? That needs defining and operationalizing. And what is a pattern? That too requires definition and operationalization. And what is reliability? What is generalizability? And so on and so forth. All these constructs are worth taking on board in a context of learner time space interaction. In a nutshell, Within the context of learner time space interaction, we would like to see theory and methodology going hand in hand. And it appears from the literature that has been made available to the public, there are more and more empirical studies and we're not seeing that much conceptual work coming out. So conceptual work has yet to catch up. Because at the end of the day, I think it is through 
the use of principled methodological approaches that we're able to come closer to solving the reliability and the generalizability puzzle. Now, by way of closing my discussion, I'd like to take everybody back to the theme of this colloquium, the future of CDST approaches to second language development of methodological challenges and proposed solutions. In particular, I would like to take a segment from Diane Larson Freeman's recent publication, Larson Freeman 2020, where she said, complexity theorists are fundamentally concerned with describing and tracing emerging patterns in dynamic systems in order to explain change and growth. And this is what I take out of this quotation. Notice that I have highlighted a few words here describing and tracing patterns. I'd like to relate those to phase one and phase two, with phase one being essentially describing and charting trajectories. Phase two, where we are now, being about tracing patterns. Now notice also that there are a few words that are there are a few words in gray here. And I did that on purpose. To me, those gray words stand for the focus of phase three research. And that is to uncovering emerging patterns and to explain change and growth. And without bringing these three things together, the work to be done in phase three wouldn't be possible. 